Hello, my name is Gabriel Baker, and this is my project for CSET 4850. My project is over how to write secure code. So let's get into it. First off, we have the world today. And for this world today, we have security breaches that are still quite common. It's seen in the news and other things, uh, very big leaks um, that have been more recent. There's also big hacks and just generally smaller hacks as well that don't make it onto the news or that aren't big. But hacking and security breaches are still quite common in today's world. The good news with this is that security is always advancing. We're always trying to stay ahead of the curve. Obviously, we're trying to make sure that this problem is dealt with to the best that we can. And this is project is mainly over what security has to do with code, what secure code means for security overall in a company or a system. So first off, what, what is coding? So coding is a way to automate something or make something quicker. You could do mathematical calculations. You could automate like a door system, th things like this in terms of what we're talking about. Um, the big thing is security is not relevant entirely in a closed system. And th this is basically saying that if you have a computer program just running locally on your computer, there's no real need to think about security. So that's, that's where a lot of things came from to begin with. But it, it's important to think of the fact that we are moving towards a more open and more, um, a more like a user friendly system. So the questions we have today is how open will the the how open will the software be and how many users are? When you're thinking about coding, um, that's something that you need to keep in mind is how many people are going to be using it. You need to think about who your audience is, who you're marketing this to. You need to think about what the hardware and the system setup is, the software limitations, the time, both in production and the life. And so what this means is what OS is it running on? Like what type of hardware is it running on and how much time do you have to put into the product um, to develop it and how long do you think it's going to last? All of these are relevant when we're considering coding. So why is secure code needed in this circumstance? Well, it's because everything today is connected. It, we have so much that uses the internet and so much online that it's, it, it's a necessity to think of making your code secure when you're developing it. And the thing is, the more technology becomes relevant in today's world, the more it's going to get used overall. This means it's going to be used in larger circumstances and more dangerous circumstances. You have computers that are running like airports, computers that run some of our space programs. You have computers that run like hospitals. All, all of these are running software. And it's only going to become more dependent. And so the security of our critical infrastructure here is greatly important. So the security breach study that I have studied was this long study over 12 years. And it was to study critical infrastructure attacks. The um, critical infrastructure attacks that this went over was split up by industries. And what it saw is that all industries were facing the same increase in attacks, which is problematic, but that the financial sector was the largest targeted. This is probably due to the money that's involved with the financial sector. And the interesting thing is only 25% of the study concluded that hardware or natural causes or problems with the security, which means that 75% of this is actual relevant things. And that's what this study focused on. So what does this mean for security? It means that there was an average of 29 security breaches or failures per year. And it's increasing every year 
with the severity increasing every year. So even though 29 was the average, it's actually quite higher because in the beginning of the study, it started very low and increasing every single year. It went up to quite a high number. Um, the other important thing is this study was only over critical systems. And so the numbers are probably much larger if you consider all of technology or all of businesses. So this is why secure code is important because the number of attacks are increasing per year and the severity is increasing per year per year and so the consequences can be really big if we're talking about the critical infrastructure that this study was going over so we can learn from some of the previous failures with security we want to study some of the past mistakes so that we can always be better and always be learning some of the, the previous software failures that were brought up was the bad, what this study brought up was bad software design or implementation. And what this means, what this means is that basically the software was not, like it was just not handled very well. Like there may just be errors in general. It may just not be designed to handle some of the most basic circumstances like it's just bad code in general and those are going to be easy to exploit the other circumstance that the study really went over was that it wasn't designed to handle the errors that it gets every program regardless of how good you think you made it is going to get errors and you need to be able to handle those appropriately so that they don't increase the errors and the the problems don't get worse that everything that it doesn't create openings or ways for your program to be exploited and the other problem was lack of layers and security you want multiple layers of security because you're never going to have one impenetrable wall of security in any program so another <clears throat> type of mistake was the specification errors and this is happening whenever you have a program that has circumstances happening outside the original intention this, this doesn't always have to be hacker, hackers doing this, but this is a good way to exploit software, is to try and do things with it that it was never intended to do. This is how you get software to air. This is how you, this is how you as a software developer plan the best because people are going to try and exploit your program in ways that you hadn't thought of. So you need to really think out of the box when you're planning for security. One of the last big previous failures that was brought up in this study was management. Poor management in the software itself can lead to a lot of errors. It makes everything easier to exploit. And it's, it's overall just makes your data more vulnerable. One of the big things you want to do is keep data stay safe. And bad management within the software is one of the biggest problems towards this. And this is also why outdated software can be more vulnerable is because the management systems just aren't up to date to today's standards. So moving a little bit past some of the previous problems, we have how to set everything up good for now. So we we know we know several of the problems that were brought up and you know why they are there. But we need to know how to fix the common problems and how to design for the future and th this is really what we're going to get into is how to design for the future and best practices Bre best practices are your way to be able to design for the future because no matter what the future has in terms of needing this software written um, needing this security implemented the best practices will set you up to have this most secure code possible of any in any time period so we have 10 secure coding practices the first one is extremely important this is just validating input this means that you check the data that's incoming to you that means that when soft or when a software is asking for user input that it checks that user input before it gets implemented to anything and this can stop a ton of errors before they they're even starting if you check the 
code that, or if you check the, the user input, you can stop the user from trying to exploit things going on in your program. The second one is compiler warnings. This one's simple. Your compiler is how the compiler is there to throw everything together. It's going to show you the warnings and it's going to show you the errors. And not all of these will stop your program dead in its tracks. A lot of them can be like quote ignored, but they really shouldn't be. The compiler is going to give you ways to plan for um, attacks or errors that would happen. So the third one is the design for security policies. The basic way to say this is that your security policies should be thought of when you're writing the software. You shouldn't just write a bunch of code and then later on be like, oh no, I need to add I need to add this security measure into it or this. They should be thought of while it's going on to make the program more secure. And this also gives you the opportunity to make the layers of security as independent as possible so that if one goes down, you still have more and to make it as deep as possible. That way, you've even if a hacker gets really within your program, there are still layers of security even at the very basic levels. The fourth one is simplicity. This in itself is simple to understand. Someone is going to work behind you and they need to be able to understand your program. And even beyond that, while you are working on your program, you need to be able to understand it. Even though you wrote it, it's always true that the more simple the program is, the less likely that there are errors and the easier it is for you to be able to comprehend and understand it. Number five is default deny. This is every, sing every single thing, every single permission is blocked automatically by default. And what this allows you to do is this allows you to give specific exceptions to this. This means that you are specifically allowing something through the deny of everything. That means you know exactly what you're allowing in and you know exactly who you're allowing in. You don't have to worry about users finding holes in you trying to deny things. Number six is least privilege. This means that you should always give a section of your program, any individual process, the absolute minimum permission needed to complete the job. This is just a safe way of making sure that if one of your processes is compromised, it's not going to lead to a hacker being able to exploit everything within your program. Number seven is to sanitize data to foreign systems. This is simple, this just means when you are sending data outside of your program, you need to make sure that it's not linked to a process that use that data, and you need to make sure especially that it's not linked to your database. The way that I explain this is essentially like an airlock. You're going to put all the data in an airlock. That way when you open it to the outside world, there's no way that anything outside is going to be able to get to your processes or your database. Number eight is defense depth. This is simple. You just want layers on layers and layers and layers. You want as many layers to your program as possible, and that's going to increase your security. Number nine is quality assurance. This is basically checking your program for bugs. This is trying to break your program and seeing what happens when you try and break it. This is really going to help you fix errors, and this is going to highlight the least secure parts of your program. You want to try and do this as much as possible. Number 10 is coding to a standard. You want to stay consistent with your industry standards. You want to make sure everyone in your company is on the same page so that everyone's following the same procedures and no one has to guess. And you want to try and stay up to date with technology. The more you follow a coding standard, the, easier, the more secure your program will be and the easier it is for other people to pick that up. So moving forward, we have some security techniques that will really make the, really make code, secure code. They don't always need to be followed, but they really make things easier for coding overall. And they're based off of some of the identified errors in the beginning and some of the um, strong standards that we just went through. So the first one is buffer overruns. This is by having a large amount of data trying to be placed in a space that can't hold it. And these should always be considered exploitable if they're given enough time or data. This means that you should always watch out for them. The very simple fix is validate input. 
If you validate input, then the user is not inputting directly into your program. It's getting checked. And if there's a problem with what they're entering, then it can get stopped before it even gets tried to put into whatever data structure you're trying to put it into. The second security technique is access control list. We went over this within the class, but this is still very important. The access control list is one of the last lines of defense if a hacker is already in there because it can prevent them from just accessing whatever they want or doing whatever they want. You need to make sure that you use a deny all policy by default. This is going to keep everyone incapable of doing things unless you specifically set it up that way. That means that you can choose who's allowed to edit things, who's allowed to see things, and who's allowed to just manage things overall. And that can really be a good addition to security. If a hacker gets in, they're not going to be able to see anything, edit anything, or change anything just by default if you have a strong access control list. You do, however, need to make sure that you manage the access control list based off the needs of the company and based off of the technology that you're going to be using this for. The next one is cryptography. Cryptography should not be the main thing of your security. A lot of sources try to make cryptography seem more important than it is, but it is just one layer of what it is. You want to make sure that you use cryptography in a very secure way so that it, everything is as random as possible. And you want to make sure that you deal with the keys very well. You don't want to steal you don't want to store keys just in plain text or just out open so that if a hacker gets in the program, they'll see all of it. You want it to be random and you want to make it so that none of the information for the cryptography can ever really be found. It can only ever be used. This is going to keep all of your data secure, even if the hacker gets access to it. And the last one is secret data. And this has to do similar to what the other one was where you use measures to protect the secret data. You, the two big problems with this is information disclosure and tampering. You don't want people to mess with the data, and you don't want more people that are supposed to know, more people to know than who are supposed to know. The easiest way to do this is you want to gather the secret data as rarely as pro possible. You do not want to have it just be open all the time, only gathered when it's needed. The next one is encryption, just like what I was previously talking about. You want to make sure that even if someone gets access to the data, they're not going to be able to see anything with it or do anything with it. And this again has to do with the limited access as possible. You want to keep the data secret. So the last slide I have here is the world tomorrow. We went over what the world is today. Technology is going to continue and continue to grow and cybercrime is only going to increase with that growing, especially with a more online present. It's important when writing secure code that we pay attention both to the past and to what is happening today and that we learn from that. It's important that we follow the practices so that we have the most secure code possible no matter what type of code we're writing. It's also important to learn and implement even more secure coding techniques. I only went over four for the purpose of this, but there's almost an endless supply of secure coding techniques, and it's important to find the ones that are most relevant to the software that's being written. We need to increase security at a faster pace than the malicious attacks are increasing by if we want to have the ever-present online world of the future be a safe place. Here are my work cited for the project. Uh, that was my project on how to write secure code, and I hope that you learned something from it.